disciplines in the multidisciplinary rehabilitation for stroke. Now, uh, the most important thing is uh, aquatic therapy is also known by uh, various other names. So for anybody, any of the patients or therapists who are uh, looking out for aquatic therapy, it's also known as hydrotherapy, water therapy, aquatic exercises, hydrology, uh, water exercises. All of that means the same, aquatic rehab or aquatic therapy. Why do we need aquatic therapy in, uh, in stroke? So it is very important to understand why aquatic therapy is required in stroke. Uh, in stroke patients, uh, what happens is whenever there is a damage to brain, uh, the brain is not able to function correctly. And because of that, also the uh, the movements are impaired. Now, the biggest challenge in regaining these movements is the gravity. Uh, when there is muscle weakness, a uh, person is not able to perform movements against gravity. So the biggest advantage of aquatic therapy in this rehabilitation is that it's able to defeat gravity. How we can achieve this with aquatic therapy, I will share with you shortly. Uh, it helps in facilitation of movement. So water, along with providing a little bit of resistance to the movement, it also supports a person or supports a body part. And that helps uh, in facilitating the movement. Also, everybody, uh, most of the people are uh, a bit of uh, if water enters our nose or uh, you know splashes on our face, a bit startled or scared, and some instinctive or reactive behaviors kick in, which help in facilitating new movements. So if I'm not able to use a particular body part and I'm in water, uh, and I feel that I'm going to drown or the water is going to enter my nose, then I'm going to try to do certain movements, which may trigger the muscles that otherwise I can't use on land. Uh, it also helps in promotion of motor learning. Now, motor learning is a process where we learn how to perform a particular movement. Like we learn how to read, we also learn how to perform movements. Since childhood uh, or since birth, the body uh, gets a lot of experiences through various sensory systems like vision, hearing, touch. And in response to those sensory systems, we perform certain movements. And these movements are recorded in the brain. And the brain continuously fine tunes uh, to perform the efficient way to achieve uh, the you know the required outcome. And this whole process is called motor learning. Like any kind of learning, repetition helps in motor learning. So water or aquatic therapy helps to promote this motor learning as well. It helps to strengthen the muscles. Strengthening of muscles uh, can be achieved with aquatic therapy. And certain muscles that we may not be able to address on land, certain muscles that we may not be able to facilitate on land, we can facilitate in water uh, in a better way. It also helps to prevent fibrotic processes. Now, this is something very important because fibrotic processes uh, basically mean scar formation in, in our body or the tissue. Uh, we know that whenever uh, we get an injury, so suppose I cut my hand and then this Skin, it bleeds. This scar is not like the other skin tissue. The properties of the two are changed. So sometimes there's slight numbness on the car, scar. Sometimes the sensitivity of the scar is not so well. So any scar formation in the body, uh, it changes the tissue, uh, stop quality of tissue. The same happens to the muscles, nerves, and all the other connective tissue in the body. So when a person gets stroke or paralysis, what happens is initial few days, the brain is not able, because the brain is damaged, the brain is not functioning, the arms and the legs or, you know, either the arm or leg or both don't function well. When they don't function, there is a period of immobilization. So a patient or a person is bedridden, bedridden. And during that bedridden scene, what happens is that the joints and tissue become stiff. And there is this adhesive fibrotic processes going on in the body that increase this stiffness. Now, how water helps to prevent these fibrotic processes? So we will come to that slowly, but it helps to reduce this fibrosis in the body. It also reduces the inflammation in the body, and therefore it helps to directly address the physiology of the stroke itself. So it helps 
to reduce the neuroinflammation and inflammation in the body overall. It also helps to reduce the joint dysfunction. Now, uh, I'm sure you uh, all of you must have uh, seen uh, either you know your family members or your relatives or somebody you know uh, who've had stroke and the way they walk or the way they perform movements. Or you might have seen it in the you know in the in the feature films or on the TV. Uh, when they walk, there is a slight limp there because there is muscle weakness. So the pattern of movement is considerably changed. When that is changed, there's a lot of stress on the joints because they are not in their optimal position. So people may walk with the knee slightly bent or their foot may fall down and because of that, the foot turns inside and they may walk on that foot. So because of this, the joints can be damaged. But this joint dysfunction can be prevented in water because of the weightlessness that water provides. It can also help to improve the cardiovascular endurance. This is one very good benefit as uh, compared to land-based rehabilitation. Uh, because it's difficult to perform movements against gravity, the mobility of patients is considerably reduced. They're not able to walk, or sometimes they're not able to perform even the bed mobility, like turning in the bed, sitting up in the bed. And because of that, there's a lot of pooling of blood, a stagnation of blood in the extremities, like the legs and the arms. And the blood circulation is not occurring properly because the person is not mobile. But if the person is immersed in water, this blood circulation can be enhanced. We will be discussing about this in a, in a short while. So it improves the cardiovascular endurance. It also helps to improve the respiratory strength and endurance. So when there is a weakness of the muscle, the breathing also is affected or the breathing is also altered. And the respiratory muscles may also undergo weakness because of the small, uh, because of the uh, lack of the movements and mobility in, in one's body. So water or aquatic therapy can also help to improve this respiratory strength and endurance. So what are the unique properties of water that make is a good environment for doing therapy. So water is colorless. So it's possible for a therapist to see the patient without any barrier. It is odorless. Uh, it is a good solvent, good conductor of heat, and good conductor of electricity. So the last point is something that we need to be wary of or we have to be careful about. Uh, that is a safety precaution that must be taken that no electrical uh, wiring or anything to contact with the aquatic therapy equipment. Now, what are the therapeutic properties of water? Whatever properties we saw earlier, they make it a good environment. They, they make water as a good environment for treatment. But how can water uh, provide therapeutic effects? So, how water emotion provides therapeutic effects? Now, the biggest and the most advantageous uh, quality is buoyancy. Now, density of water is one unit. So all the other uh, densities are compared to water. Now, if you can see here, density of water is one, whereas density of air is 0.0013, which is approximately 800 times lighter than water. So yes, uh, it you may feel that how then water helps in performing the movements. So there is a dual action in water. Water helps to perform the move because of buoyancy where it counteracts the gravitational force but when uh, we are not moving against uh, you know in that plane where it's counteracting the gravity water also provides a considerable resistance to the movement because it's very thick as compared to air so if if i move my hand in the air i will not feel it but if i move my hand in the water i can really feel the movement and it's difficult to do that so this is because of the density of the water uh, the buoyancy of the water is the upward force that is exerted by the water to counteract the gravity. This is what gives the weightlessness in water. And it also creates a metacentric effect. The metacentric effect is a rotational force that any object uh, experiences when, when placed in water. So if you see, there are two points which are very important for us when we uh, take a patient or when we ourselves go in water. First is center of gravity. Basically, the point around which the mass of the body is evenly distributed and center of buoyancy. Um, 
So that is the point where the buoyancy is acting maximum. How do these two points affect a body? So when we are standing straight, uh, center of gravity and the buoyancy are on top of each other, so they are cancelling out the forces and they are completely stable in water. When we lie down flat on the water as well, we are stable because again the center of buoyancy and gravity are one below the other. But if you are bent forward or sideways or turned, all of these postures bring about a, uh, uh, an imbalance in the two forces. So if you can see here, gravity is acting down and uh, buoyancy is acting up. So there is a rotational force in this circular direction. Okay, so depending upon whether the buoyancy overpowers or the gravity overpowers, the body may turn like this or may turn like this. This is a very important uh, therapeutic property for, for because we are using this particular property, we can stimulate the muscles in various ways and uh, we can get the reactive behaviors which will facilitate movements in the muscles that otherwise on land is not possible. The second, uh, so the third property is viscosity. Now, viscosity is the internal friction between the two molecules of the water. So we all know that uh, something like honey, we say honey is more viscous than water. It is more sticky, and uh, the, the the fluidity of that liquid is much lesser. So viscosity is also responsible for the resistance that we experience in water for the movement. Cohesion and adhesion. Uh, this is also another property of water that is responsible for the resistance that we feel for a movement. It's basically when two molecules of water, how they, uh, how the molecular water is held together, and how the two molecules stick to each other. So cohesion and adhesion are the two properties that render the viscosity to water itself. Hydrostatic pressure. Now another very important therapeutic property. Hydrostatic pressure is the pressure that water exerts on the immersed object. Now, one very good quality of water is that it exerts equal pressure on the object, no matter the depth or of immersion, or uh, what is the shape of the object. Yes, as we go deeper, the pressure that is exerted by water is more, but it's equal. So it is not exerting pressure on a particular part or point more than the other. Why is this pressure important? Um, we, we have all seen that if we sit for a long time or if we travel by bus or, or flight or long flight or we are standing for a long time, as we, as we go on, uh, we see that there's a slight swelling that develops around the ankles. That is called as pedal edema. Now this edema is because the blood is pooled in the feet and the body is not able to pump this blood back to the heart. And because of that, there is a slight swelling-like appearance that we observe. Now, this swelling uh, develops all the more in neurological patients and especially patients with stroke because their muscles are immobile, their muscles are inactive. And because of that, the fibril edema or the swelling can be significantly more as compared to somebody of the same age who does not have stroke. In water, because of this hydrostatic pressure, what happens is there is a natural compression force on the blood vessel. And so it's, it uh, helps, it gives a pumping action, which throws the blood upwards towards the heart. And because of that, the pedal edema can be reduced. Now, this pedal edema can uh, give a lot of, um, uh, can rise to blood pressure onto the kidneys and lungs. It can have a bad effect not only on the feet, on the local tissues that are there, but also on the heart and heart and the kidney function. So hydrostatic pressure helps in preventing this uh, pedal edema or reducing this pedal edema, and therefore contributes to renal and cardiovascular function of the stroke patient. So this is what is hydrostatic pressure. So if the body part is immersed, the water exerts pressure from all the sides. And it's a three-dimensional pressure or force that is exerted. You can see a person sitting in water, the force is exerted all over the body. The pressure that he feels in the legs is far more than the pressure felt on the chest. So as we go deeper in the water, the pressure exerted increases. Compressibility. So we, uh, we, 
uh, I'm sure you all know the, the cooking gas that we use uh, in, in all our houses. It is compressed and when it's compressed, it turns into a liquid state. So that so gas is compressible, air is compressible. What it means is we can make the volume of the air smaller. But it is not possible to do that with water. And therefore, it provides a great resistance to the movement, which can be used to improve the strength of the muscle. Refraction is a quality that a therapist really needs to know and be aware of and be wary of because uh, refraction, if you can see the straw here in both the glasses, it looks like uh, it's bent in this one and it's broken and disjointed in this one. But in reality, the straw is neither broken nor bent. It's just immersed in water. And because of the differences in the density and the refraction of the light, uh, reflection of the light, uh, it looks like it is bent or disjointed. So it gives slightly a different appearance of something that is on top of the surface of the water and something that is immersed in water. So this is something the therapist needs to know when they are observing the patient and their movement and account refraction uh, so that when you are assessing somebody in water, uh, you know that okay, if there's some uh, you know some abnormality or some deviation, it is not because necessarily because of the the body posture, it can be because of refraction of water as well. The next property of water, this is also known as one of the hydrodynamic principles, uh, is the drag force. Before we go to the drag force, uh, I want to talk about eddy currents. Eddy currents are the small ripples that are formed in the water when any object moves from point A to point B. Now, why these uh, eddy currents are formed? Um, any any object, if uh, different shapes of object, basically, make, if the water is flowing straight, there's one layer of water moving on the other. But when an object is thrown in the pool or in the in the water, it forms different currents. So there is a turbulent flow of water that is created. So water is not flowing in one direction, but it's flowing in different directions. And this gives rise to eddy currents. These eddy currents call, uh, uh, give rise to the drag force. The drag force is the force that resists the movement of the object in water. So if you see uh, this wooden block has a lot of eddy currents, so it's very difficult to move this wooden block in water. Whereas this particular uh, round shape, the eddy currents are lesser, so it will be easier to move to. But if you see this fish-shaped object, this is the most ideal, and it creates almost no eddy currents, and so it can move in water very easily. Why is this important uh, for us to know? So this is again important for the therapist uh, to understand how changing body posture, uh, changing body positions, what kind of effect will it have on the patient's body? What kind of resistance will they feel? And it can be utilized to give the either greater resistance or the lesser resistance as required. So it is relative density. Now, relative density, uh, what it means is, as I said, the density of water is unit or one uh, unit. So everything else is compared, every other uh, substance density is compared with water. And depending on whether it is more or less than one, it will either float on water or drown or sink in water. So why do we need to know that? Because different body tissues have different density and different relative density. So certain body tissues can float on water, certain body tissues can sink in water. That's why every human being has a different density. So every human being has a different ability or uh, a different tendency to either sink in water or float in water. A therapist needs to know what will happen to the patient when they are entering the pool. Sometimes with stroke patients, what happens is that the density or the tissue quality of uh, the one side that is affected can be different from the side that is not affected. So if there is muscle weakness, uh, the side that has muscle weakness will have a different tissue composition as compared to side that does not have muscle weakness. And this has to be kept in mind because when they enter the water, they instantly will feel a rotational force because of gravity and buoyancy acting on their body. So this will create an imbalance even when they are standing in water. 
and that can be used either therapeutically therapeutically to train them but also we have to be aware of it because they are going to be at a higher risk of not being able to balance or stabilize themselves when they are in water. So what are the tissues that float or sink in water? So if we see the fat and the connective tissue, it floats on the water, whereas the muscle and bone, they sink on the water. So these are the properties or the therapeutic properties of water that help in stroke rehabilitation. But what are the positive effects of water immersion or aquatic therapy on the body that make it uh, relevant in this rehabilitation. So all of these properties, what effect do they create on our body? So first is cardiovascular system or the heart relaxation. Now, uh, I'm not going to get into the, the flow chart. Uh, it, it seems very complicated, but to simply uh, put it, the aquatic therapy helps to increase the blood flow back to the heart. As I already explained, the hydrostatic pressure helps to uh, pump the blood up. It helps to pump the lymphatic, uh, the lymph up uh, back to the heart as well. And because of that, the heart can pump out more blood as well. So blood circulation overall is improved because of just water immersion. And if we add exercises onto that, it can give much better effect. What effect does it have on the respiratory system? Now the respiratory system, again, uh, if you can see here, this is the important thing that we need to understand. When immersed in chest level water, so if the person is gone uh, so deep that only the head is out of the water, then the work of breathing or uh, the amount of energy that one needs to spend for breathing increases by 60%. So it is very difficult to breathe inside water as compared to on land. So if somebody has already has a respiratory muscle weakness, then the therapist has to be precautious about how much immersion to choose. Of course, as the immersion goes uh, below chest level, the work of breathing will also reduce. So if somebody is immersed only to abdominal level or to waist level, then work of breathing will be slightly improved, not a lot. Majority of the work of breathing is increased because there is a hydrostatic pressure on the chest. So there's something compressing on the chest and we have to beat against that compression. And because of that, it's more difficult to breathe in water. In stroke, uh, it may not necessarily uh, be very, uh, you know, very uh, difficult to do this in water or difficult to breathe in water. But some of the uh, some of the areas of brain that control breathing, the muscles that are responsible for breathing, if they are affected, then the therapist has to be very careful. So instead of taking the patient in the pool vertically, we can take them in the water in the supine position so that the hydrostatic pressure is not exerted on the chest wall completely and they are able to breathe without any problem. Or choose the level of immersion which is lesser so that the breathing can be easier. Uh, what we would suggest is that if the ability or there is something called the maximum inspiratory volume, what it means is the ability to breathe maximum uh, uh, air that can be breathed in and uh, in one breath. If that is lesser than 250 ml, so if a person is not able to breathe even 250 ml of air in one breath on land, then it is advisable that they be, that a patient is not taken in water at chest level immersion because then it will be very difficult for them to breathe in. They can be taken in water by experienced aquatic therapists who are able to understand the sign of respiratory distress or understand when the patient is not able to be and uh, take necessary actions and precautions if in case that happens. For a novice aquatic therapist who hasn't got much experience, I would say it is a contraindication. So 250 ml, if the inspiratory rate is less, inspiratory volume is less than that, then do not take the patient for aquatic therapy. The renal and endocrine system. Now, the renal system is basically our kidneys, and endocrine system is different hormones that are released in the body. So, water or immersion in water also has an effect on how our kidneys function. Uh, obviously, because the blood that is pumped out by the heart increases, 
the blood that flows to the kidneys also increase. So the filtration of the blood uh, is much, so there is more volume to be filtered and therefore the filtrate is also more. So naturally when a person is exercising in water, they, are a, they feel like going to the toilet much more often or much sooner as compared to land. This also helps to reduce the edema. So the fetal edema that I spoke to, spoke to you about the, uh, in, in the beginning, uh, that can also, if the filtration improves, then the, the water that is stagnated in the interstitial compartment will also be removed effectively. Uh, on the endocrine system or on the uh, different hormones that are secreted in the body, uh, water has a positive effect as well. So water improves the secretion of uh, dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. Now, dopamine is the is the hormone that is important for movement. So voluntary movements and movement control. It's also the hormone that uh, that um, gives rise to happy emotions or it controls a little bit of uh, emotional aspect also in human beings. And epinephrine and norepinephrine also are responsible for positive emotional effects on, on a person. So increase in these, uh, increase in the secretion of these hormones um, doesn't only have a big effect on the physical aspect of the stroke rehabilitation, but also on the cognitive and mental aspect of stroke rehabilitation. So a lot of patients who undergo stroke, they experience uh, different psychological uh, symptoms as well. It can be depression, anxiety uh, in these patients, uh, either because of the condition, uh, because of the disability that they are experiencing, or because the because of the brain area that is affected or involved. And sec secretion of these hormones can really help to relieve those symptoms as well. Now the musculoskeletal system. It is uh, we've already seen. So although stroke is a disease or a stroke is a condition of brain. Uh, it originates because the brain is not functioning properly. Over the time, it also affects uh, or it also become, becomes more of neuromusculoskeletal in nature. It's not only the neurological condition. Because the muscles and the bones are also affected after a certain time. When there is no movement, the muscles undergo atrophy or muscles undergo something called as um, shrinking because they're not being used for a long time. Also, the joints become more stiff and rigid, the, the, what we discussed earlier about the fibrosis. So because of this, the muscles become shortened and tight. So a lot of stroke patients uh, show that there's tightness in the calf muscles, which can, which, because of which they are not able to move their ankles effectively. There can be a lot of uh, tightness in the hand muscles also. So the arms and legs tend to uh, be immobile in a particular position. So this is a quite common posture that we see in the stroke patients. Because of this, there can be tightness in the elbow uh, elbow joint, uh, in the bicep muscle, there can be tightness of the wrist flexor, because the wrist is always in the flex position. There can be tightness of the finger flexors. And because of that tightness, even if the muscles start working, there's a great resistance for the movement. And that's this to make it more difficult to achieve the functional rehabilitation or the functional independence in these patients. So how does uh, water have an effect on musculoskeletal system? So this is something uh, important to understand. So GRF is ground reaction force. So if you see uh, when we perform a land-based activity, the ground reaction force is considerably higher. But if we perform a water-based activity, then the ground reaction force is much lesser. Why is this? Because of the weightlessness that the body experiences. So if we see here, this is a human body. When it is immersed in water at chest level, or at the neck level, then only 10% of the body weight can be felt by the ankles, knees, and the, uh, and the body. So if a person weighs 100 kgs, if immersed in neck deep water, the weight will only reduce to only 10 kgs. If the person is immersed at chest level, then it will be only 25 to 30 kg. If they are immersed in waist level, then it is 50 percent, uh, so 50 kg. If they are immersed in high level, then 65 kg. And if they are immersed in shin, it is 85 kg. So we can achieve a great uh, benefit with this because when the weight is reduced, 
so movements can be facilitated much better. So what effects does it have on the nervous system? So this is very important to know. Uh, water provides a lot of uh, sensory stimulation for uh, the skin. So sensory nerve endings that we find in the skin. Now, as I had explained earlier uh, in, the, in the beginning of uh, the webinar, the motor learning can only occur in response to the sensory stimuli. Now, whenever there is stroke, depending on which area of the brain is involved, there can be sensory and motor impairment or only motor impairment or only sensory impairment. What it means is that I may not be able to uh, feel uh, the touch and the pain in the affected parts of my body, like in my arms and my legs. I may not be able to feel it. I may not be able to feel it when I'm performing a movement or a passive movement is performed. That can be affected. Now, if that is affected, then my brain will not be stimulated to, uh, to perform a movement because the sensory inputs are very less. And the movement is only performed in response to a sensory movement. So if the skin is affected, the only, only sensory cues or the only sensory stimuli a person gets is through vision or hearing. So a person is greatly dependent only on these two senses when they get stroke. Now, if we can improve the sensory stimulation of the skin, we can also facilitate the movements much better. Now, as I said, if I move my hand in uh, air, then I don't feel it or I don't feel the air in my body. The sensory stimulation when we are doing movement in the air is much less. But in water, it is increased a lot more. And because of that, it not only stimulates the touch, but also the pressure receptors and the temperature receptors. Because there's always a bit of difference in the temperature of water, the surface layer and the bottom layer, and also as compared to the ambient air temperature. We can also monitor the temperature of the food. Uh, so the therapeutic foods, which I will discuss with you in a while, have temperature monitoring, because of which the temperature sensors can also be stimulated. Uh, of course, the touch, because water can be felt on the skin every movement that we perform. And there is a hydrostatic pressure on the body in when we immerse it at any level. And this stimulates the pressure receptors also. So there is much uh, more sensory stimulation going for the brain. It also has a relaxation effect by activating reticular system, reticular activating system. Now, this is the system responsible for us feeling, uh, for us, uh, for the sleep. Uh, it, it, if it's activated, then uh, we are more, uh, so we can get a relaxation effect as well. Also, there is a secretion of a lot of hormones like dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. And these hormones can also lead to relaxation effect. Water also suppresses the sympathetic activity, which is autonomous activity, which uh, is mainly responsible. So this is a, this is a system that increases the stress in the body. And uh, parasympathetic activity or parasympathetic uh, systems are the systems that reduce the stress in the body. So suppression of sympathetic uh, system reduces the overall stress in the body and we feel relaxed. Uh, it also it reduces anxiety and water also helps in secretion of certain neurotrophic factors. Now what are neurotrophic factors? These are the chemicals that help to uh, prevent the damage to the nerves or damage to the neurons. Uh, and it also there are certain factors in this which also help to reduce the inflammation or the swelling of the tissue inside the body. So not so the therapeutic benefits of water are not only uh, for the neurological disorders, but we can also use aquatic therapy for cardiovascular conditions, for respiratory conditions. We can use it in muscular condi musculoskeletal conditions and other neurological conditions also, apart from stroke. We can also use in different uh, uh, disorders that children uh, pay, uh, that are seen in children, so pediatric conditions and uh, disorders that are seen old, uh, at old age or elderly individuals in geriatric conditions. Now, what effect does aquatic therapy have on the psychological aspect? So there are various studies performed which show that aquatic therapy can help to reduce the anxiety in the person. There are studies that also talk about how aquatic therapy can help in reducing the depression. So how does that uh, how does water help to reduce depression? Aquatic therapy 
can increase the release of endorphin, dopamine, and serotonin, which are also known as happy hormones. It also helps to gain, uh, to increase the self-confidence and self-efficacy. How does that happen? So, a person who is not able to walk on land uh, can easily walk in water because of the weightlessness and because the water is supportive. This can give a uh, person a sense of self, uh, you know, self confidence and independence that they are able to perform movements and uh, they are not as uh, dependent or as crippled as they may feel on them. So many of the stroke patients uh, have a difficult, um, uh, it's difficult for them to adjust to not being able to use their body fat. So if we take them in water and they are able to use it better, then it boosts their confidence and it gives them hope that they can regain movement. Now what are the limitations of land-based rehabilitation in stroke? So the, as I said in the beginning of the talk, movements are constantly hindered by gravity. So, they are, so a lot of people are not able to walk, lift their hands up, or perform different movements because gravity is restricting or resisting those movements. This also increases the risk of falls because they are not able to stand properly because only one side of the body is moving, or so one side of the body is uh, affected. So there is imbalance in the body, so they cannot stand properly, they cannot balance themselves when they are walking, which increases the risk of falls. And if they fall on land, um, Usually, we see that stroke happens in the patient's uh, old age patient. And uh, if they fall at the old age, there is a considerable risk of fractures of the bone as well. They can be quite detrimental. So, that, that, that is one limitation for land based rehabilitation. There is increased joint compression. So, when we are standing, the gravity is pulling us down, and the joints are always in the compressed uh, state when, when we are upright. And that can also help, that can also lead to. Um, uh, that they also uh, reduce or uh, can hamper the health of the joints or the integrity of the joints and water can help prevent. So there is uh, more restriction to performing the movement on that. There is pooling of blood in the limbs which we have discussed and uh, in certain neuromuscular conditions movements can also cause harm when performed on it. So how we can, uh, how aquatic therapy can complement land-based therapy uh, by eliminating these limitations. So as we discussed, the movements can be facilitated by buoyancy. Risk of falls is very negligible. Even if somebody falls in water, the maximum uh, detrimental effect it can have is maybe a little bit of loss of confidence and that they may inhale uh, or ingest some water and uh, because of that they may cough. But if a supervised therapy program is done, this can be minimized significantly, but it does not have any harmful effect on the musculoskeletal system. The joint compression is reduced because of the weightlessness. There is more degree of freedom of movement uh, to the person. Better blood circulation reduces the swelling and uh, 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 stimulation of autonomic nervous systems can also help in the movement. So what is aquatic therapy? Now we discussed so much about water and the benefits of immersion in water. So if just by being inside the water, there are so many benefits, why do we need to perform aquatic therapy? So aquatic therapy means that uh, an individual who's experienced or who has an understanding of these properties of water, uh, they, uh, he or she uses these properties to get maximum therapeutic benefit. So so using the gravity, using the gas force, using the, uh, the resistance that is provided by what the therapist can uh, get more functional independence in the patient as compared to on land. Uh, the therapist can give a stimulation for certain movements using the metacentric effect and the reactive behavior. So aquatic therapy is activities performed in water under a supervised or under the supervision of a trained aquatic therapist with a therapeutic goal. So there has to be a goal that a therapist sets for the patient. It can be something as simple as lifting the hand up uh, to shoulder level, or it can be some, uh, something more uh, significant, like being able to walk in water, being climbing stairs, crossing the obstacles, uh, the fine movements of the hand. So it is a goal-oriented therapy. Different techniques that the aquatic therapist may use is uh, water-specific therapy, Bhadrakar's ring method, uh, clinical Aichi, Vatsu, and aquatic exercises. So 
so and uh, there are different relaxation techniques as well there are different stretching techniques as well i won't go in the depth of these techniques because uh, it will become very technical otherwise so the main message to take away from this talk is that land based therapy or aquatic therapy is not a fight it's not that we are trying to counter or we are trying or we are trying to find an option for land based therapy it is a teamwork so whatever limitations we face in the land based rehabilitation we can uh, reduce those limitations with aquatic therapy so it has to be done together simultaneously uh, and the land based therapy and aquatic therapy have to uh, discuss with each other to achieve maximum or to give maximum benefit to the patient so where can aquatic therapy be done aquatic therapy can be done in public swimming pools with uh, experienced therapists or it or it can be done in the therapeutic pool so this is how a therapeutic pool uh, may look like this is the pool that we have at our center in neurogen brain spine institute if you see the pool uh, the uh, there is uh, an entrance for the therapist but there is also an facility for patients who are not able to walk so this is a chair that can be lifted up and then it can be taken inside the pool so the person or the patient can be seated on the chair and then they can be taken in the pool where they can perform exercises and then can be taken out so this is a very important aspect of the therapeutic pool uh, therapeutic pools have a temperature control or temperature monitoring or heating uh, systems in place so that the water can be heated to a particular uh, temperature as required for therapy there is a easy accessibility for patients so if you see public swimming pools there is usually a ladder some may have steps uh, and there can be some difference uh, between the deck of the pool and the water level this may this may create difficulties for patients who have neurological uh, disorders like in stroke patients who are not able to move uh, uh, correctly so they are not able to walk some patients may not be able to sit without balance also Uh, sit without support, sorry, or balance themselves uh, without support in sitting posture. So it is very difficult for these patients to to be taken inside the pool in public swimming pool. So therapeutic pools have a ease of access. The water temperature is monitored. Also, the quality of water is measured and monitored very rigorously in the therapeutic pool. So uh, the water chemistry uh, is checked every week. Uh, also any biological contamination in the pool water is also monitored very strictly in the therapeutic pools um certain points uh, that uh, should be discussed are contraindications for aquatic therapy so which are the patients that cannot do aquatic therapy or which are the patients for whom uh, it may be more uh, it may it may be risky to do aquatic therapy now, if patients have any wounds any open wounds on the body then they can't be taken inside the water because the wound can get infected or the wound will be hampered when they are in water if the open wound is exposed to water there are certain uh, methods available to make sure that the wound is sealed off from the water so there are bandages that can be used uh, waterproof bandages and these bandages can help uh, take the person in the pool so it is a relative contraindication but for novice therapists who don't have Uh, the experience of how to handle an uh, open wound in water, uh, it can be considered as a contraindication. Uh, another contraindication is for patients who don't have bowel bladder sensation or control. What it means is that patients who are not able to understand when they want to go to the toilet. Uh, why is this? It's when to maintain the pool hygiene. It is a big risk to maintain the pool hygiene, and also uh, it's a risk of hygiene for the patient themselves. so again there are certain diapers and uh, certain swimwear that can be used so that uh, the you know, there is no contamination in case if there is an accident in the pool so this is also relative contraindication but it may be difficult to take patients who don't have bowel bladder condition in the swimming pool thirdly some of the stroke patients also exhibit that they get epilepsy or seizures after stroke Uh, if they get these epilepsy attacks or seizure uh, during uh, rehabilitation it can be detrimental can be fatal also and it's a big risk for their health also the reflection and the refraction of light from the surface of the water can sometimes even trigger seizures and therefore it is a relative contraindication 
again, an experienced therapist may choose to take patients with seizures and epilepsy in the pool uh, if uh, they are confident about being able to manage uh, the patient if there is a seizure while they are performing the treatment. Uh, another contraindication is, is if the patient has any cardiac condition. So some cardiac conditions, uh, it may be difficult or it may, uh, they may exaggerate like tachycardia or uh, certain, uh, you know, uh, the fibrillation that it's better not to take them in the pool because if the person gets any cardiac event, uh, the evacuation may be difficult or it may take more time to get help and such patients should not be taken in there. If the patients have any respiratory diseases that limit their ability to breathe, then uh, they should be taken in water with some precaution. Any skin uh, allergies or infections, uh, patients should not be taken in water. People who have hydrophobia or fear of water, or people who have chlorine uh, allergies, or there are certain uh, chemicals that are added to water to keep the water clean. Somebody has an allergy of that, then they can't be taken in the pool. Stroke patients who have aphasia. So aphasia is a symptom of the stroke where the patients are not able to speak clearly or uh, they are not able to uh, understand what the other person is speaking. In either of these conditions, it may be uh, there, it is, there has to be precaution taken before taking them in the swimming pool. If they're not able to follow the commands or if they're not able to express themselves. Uh, what are the benefits of supervised therapy? So why should we do supervised therapy for stroke patients? So in stroke, what we what uh, evidence is also shown is that the spasticity, the tightness, uh, or the resistance that happens to the movement can be reduced with aquatic therapy. We can improve the muscle strength of the patient. We can stimulate certain muscles, otherwise it's difficult to stimulate on them. The balance of the patients can be improved significantly. Uh, even better than what a land-based rehabilitation can do. So balance and standing and walking can improve much better. Also dynamic balance in sitting, when we perform movements, that can be improved in water much better. Uh, we can improve the cardiovascular endurance of the patients in the pool. It can improve the respiratory muscle strength uh, and the respiration can be enhanced because of aquatic therapy. And this can be achieved with supervised therapy because the therapist can plan and give a goal-oriented program to achieve this. Now, how long should the therapy be done? Uh, depending upon the impairments that the patient is exhibiting, the therapist would take a call as to how long should the therapy be done. Usually, one session of aquatic therapy does not exceed beyond one hour. The duration can be anywhere between half an hour to one hour, depending upon the tolerance of the patient. Uh, of aquatic therapy, so how tired, how easily they get fatigued or tired, and uh, also depending upon the bubble bladder tolerance. So some patients may have urgency or frequency of urination. In that case, the sessions can be a little smaller. But overall, uh, usually the session is 30 minutes to one hour. Uh, it can be done every day if required, but three to four times in a week is also a good frequency to get the desired effect. Uh, it is important to keep doing this for at least three to four times a week because, because if it is much lesser than that, then the transfer effect. Uh, what I mean by transfer effect is the benefit that we see in water may not be transferred on land. For example, if a patient is not able to walk uh, on land, but they're able to walk in water, that is temporarily, uh, that can be a temporary phenomenon because of the loss, recklessness and the loss of gravity. Now, uh, if we train them in that environment for a longer time, then that effect can be seen on land also. That they're able to walk on land also. But this can't be achieved in one session. This requires regular sessions to be given to the patient. Uh, and also, they have to be regular in frequency. So if we do only once in a week, it may not have the desired effect. It may take a longer time to get that transfer effect, or we may not get the transfer effect at all. So three to four times a week is a good frequency to follow for aquatic therapy. Uh, what are the adverse effects of aquatic therapy? So there are no adverse effects of aquatic therapy. Uh, there can be accidents uh, in the pool because um, a person who's not having good, con good control on the body, they may slip, they may 
So therefore, supervised therapy is very important because the therapist can take care of the patient and avoid these falls. Uh, certain pool chemicals may lead to allergies, so that is something one needs to be precautious of. There can be patients who have chlorine allergy and develop rashes or redness. Uh, aquatic therapy increases dehydration. So what I mean by dehydration is because the filtration of the kidney is working faster, so the urination is more. At the same time, there's a loss of water from the skin, like we sweat on land, we, sweat, uh, we don't sweat in water, but the water uh, is dissipated from the skin, which we don't realize. And because of that, there can be a dehydrating effect. A commonest way to find out when we are dehydrated is to see our fingers, they prune. So we develop wrinkles on our fingers, and that usually happens when the water content is lesser, or there's a bit of dehydration in the body. So it is important that we keep sitting on water and keep ourselves hydrated when we are doing exercises or when we are making patients do exercises as well. Uh, it's it's uh, quite common to feel thirsty when you come out of the pool, hungry, uh, when you come out of the pool, you may feel very tired and fatigued. It is important to give yourself uh, some time uh, or give the patients time when they are out of the pool uh, to experience the gravity again. If uh, there is a graded pool, so what I mean by graded pool is that the depth uh, of the pool is varying. Uh, then we can start in the deeper end of the pool and slowly move towards the shallower end so that the gra gravity can be felt by the patient and the effect of gravity can be increased gradually. And once they go on land, they can adapt to that sudden increase in the gravity much better. Uh, if uh, they may have a little bit of imbalance suddenly when they are on land, so the therapist should always support and uh, supervise them when, when they are being taken out of the water or the therapy assistants can also help them. So what is the evidence for uh, aquatic therapy uh, in water? So if you see here, uh, the dual task training, so uh, being able to perform two different tasks at the same time, uh, it has a positive effect on balance. Um, and gait in stroke patients. So this performed uh, in water gives a, uh, gives a benefit for balance and gait in stroke patients. There's another uh, study conducted by uh, conducted uh, by Zhang et al. It's a randomized control trial and uh, done on subacute stroke patients where they say that, see that there is increasing the muscular strength without increasing the spasticity. So aquatic exercises enhance muscle strength in paretic lower limbs and improved muscle co-contraction without increasing spasticity in subacute stroke patients. So stroke patients may, uh, we see that as uh, initially in the stroke, the muscles are flaccid, which means that they are, um, uh, they are very soft and loose and they're not able to perform the movement. And then as the stroke uh, becomes more chronic or as the time passes if the recovery is not sufficient then instead of plastic from plasticity they become spastic or the tone of the muscle increases um, which 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 gives rise to different or the gives rise to contractures and tightness and the, there's a lot of resistance to muscle movement now if we do aquatic rehab in the subacute phase when they have not developed this spasticity this can prevent development of that spasticity and facilitate movement. Uh, in chronic stroke patients also, if you see here that aquatic exercise is more effective than land-based exercise at improving joint position sense and clinical functions of stroke patients. So as discussed before, the sensory stimulation and the movement, uh, ability to perform movements, the freedom of movements is much more in water. So as compared to land-based rehab, this can be enhanced or increased in water much better with aquatic therapy. So effect of water immersion on dual task performance implications for aquatic therapy. So participants tended to make fewer cognitive errors while immersed in chest deep water as compared to on land. Now, why does this happen? One very important effect on nervous system is because the heart is able to pump more blood the blood supply to the brain also enhances, and this can improve the cognitive functions of a person. Cognitive functions is ability to be, uh, ability to focus, pay attention, and con the constant ability to concentrate can enhance when they are in water. And that's exactly what uh, this research article also says. 
So another effect, uh, another article talks about effect of aquatic therapy. Uh, they have taken a particular approach. Uh, halibut therapy known before uh, uh, it was known as halibut therapy before now it is known as water specific therapy in the subacute patients and it is a randomized control trial again so it says that this therapy is safe and well tolerated in stroke patients and it also has a positive effect on the buoyancy so if you see here uh, there was a significant improvement in the berg balancing so uh, in, in the balance of the patients, there was a significant improvement as compared to land-based rehabilitation. Effects of aquatic physiotherapy to improve uh, on the improvement of balance and corporal symmetry in stroke survival. So if you see here again, it says that uh, halibut therapy can be a useful tool to improve balance. Uh, certain PNF techniques uh, that can be used in water. Now, Badrada's ring method is also based on PNF. And it uses principles and movements uh, as uh, you know, uh, based on the PNF, uh, the proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation technique. And this also says that the, this particular article also shows that uh, performing aquatic PNF techniques can uh, benefit uh, in, in improving the balance of the stroke patients and getting them to be more independent in their day to day function. So hydrotherapy versus conventional land-based exercise for improving walking and balance after stroke. Uh, again, this is a randomized controlled trial, and the results show that there is a uh, so even if there is a short program of four weeks, uh, it results in great improvement uh, in walking balance uh, in walking and balance uh, as compared to on land. So as I said, how long should the therapy go on? We can see within four weeks. So within a short span of one month also we can get a good benefit with aquatic therapy and if you see here uh, the sessions were 45 minutes so usually the sessions span between 30 minutes to one hour a motorized aquatic treadmill exercise program uh, how does it have an effect on muscle strength cardiorespiratory fitness and other clinical functions in the subacute stroke this was also a randomized control trial now uh, I have I have used this word a lot, randomized control trials. What it means for uh, for the viewers who don't come from the therapy or clinical background, what it means is that uh, the particular treatment was given to the stroke patient. So aquatic therapy and the regular rehabilitation is given to stroke patients in one group, whereas in the other group only the regular rehabilitation is given. So this helps us to identify what additional benefit can aquatic therapy provide in addition uh, provide as compared to the regular rehabilitation so we can see here water-based aerobic exercises uh, that are performed on the aquatic treadmill can have a beneficial effect on isometric muscle strength so it can enhance muscle strength more than as compared with the regular rehabilitation the effect of obstac obstacle training and uh, in water on static balance so obstacle training course is usually used for improving the balance uh, the biggest limitation or challenge of performing this obstacle training course on land is risk of falls. So, as I said before, the risk of falls reduces in water considerably. So, but can we perform this in water? And this study says that yes, it's feasible to perform in water and uh, it can be beneficial. So, this particular study doesn't really uh, talk about what is the effectiveness of obstacle training for improving balance, which they say that it's safe. Again, if you see here, they perform the exercise three times a week for almost four months, sorry, for four months, and the sessions were usually 40 minutes long. Uh, how does it help uh, the postural balance? What uh, did mean by postural balance is uh, when, when you are standing or sitting, how are you able to maintain the balance in the static positions? And if you can see here, the balance, uh, Patients who received aquatic therapy had better balance as compared to those uh, as compared to that in the land environment. So uh, this particular study uh, talks about how if what effect water immersion has on the body rather than the aquatic therapy. Also, uh, if if you can see the systematic review shows that in various neurological disorders. There is a fair uh, evidence to support that aquatic therapy can be beneficial. 
So systematic review evaluates all the articles or all the studies that are being done in a particular field and they give a summary. So there's a fair uh, evidence that we have suggested in that. So this is the aquatic therapy department that we have at the Eurasian Brain and Spine Institute. Um, we have other doctors like Dr. Shruti Shirki, Dr. Uh, Vivek Nair, Dr. Arjun, and recently we've had Dr. Rabab joining us in the department. And I have mentioned this because whatever I've been able to present to you, uh, all the, the patients treated, all the evidence that we have, it's all because of the team work that we do. So I would like to thank my team uh, for all the support uh, that they have provided so far and i would like to thank you all for listening uh, to this talk and i hope it was uh, informative uh, and it was good for you to know about this new therapeutic modality in stroke and how it can benefit uh, in, in stroke patients so if there are any questions i would be answering the questions now uh, and just be reading the questions. Okay. There are no questions so far, so I will uh, wait for two minutes. If there are any questions, do type in, and I would be glad to answer those questions. So thank you again for uh, doing this webinar. Uh, we would have a series of webinars in the next month, so stay tuned in to neurogenbsi.com to find out more information about these webinars. And I can see there are no questions at the moment, so I will be taking your lead. Have a good evening and a nice weekend.